I think, you know, one of the things that we set out to do at OpsMX with, you know, sort of some of our tooling, specifically around application security posture management, is look for ways that we can provide value without overhead, right? So how do we make our product operationally transparent, right? But for the developer who needs data, make it really easy for them to get data around the things that they need to be paying attention to, right? So uh, that's where we get into things like prioritization and isolation, right? So uh, don't give me a report that shows me 5,000 CVEs Show me the things that are important to me as I try and move my new code from my dev system to the staging system and then ultimately into production. So, um, and by the way, guys, most of this stuff you're going to see in a demo toward the end of the presentation. So I know the, the graphics are a bit of an eye chart, but we'll get into more details with those later. So one of the things that we did to sort of respond to that need was we wanted to build what we were calling a uh, pre-flight checks, right? So for us, you know, um, you know, it's the typical deployment flow where you, you deploy first to a dev environment, then to a staging environment. Maybe there's another intermediate or lower environment prior to staging. Maybe there's a QA or something like that, right? Then it goes to staging and then ultimately it goes to production. Um, and so in this scenario, with a pre-flight check, what we had in mind was allowing for the developer to be able to come into our tool and say, hey, I've deployed this to, to my dev environment. I want to compare the security posture or what would be the net security posture change if I were to say, take what's in the development environment and deploy it to my production environment. And because we are in the background already integrated with all the tools that'll gather the data for us to be able to tell the developer this, uh, we wanted to build an interface that ultimately would allow them to do that. And so what we're doing then is we're saying, hey, let's compare how many CVEs would this resolve? How many new CVEs would it introduce? Uh, what are some of the other security problems that ultimately could uh, that this this uh, particular deployment could face? Because we've got you know sort of over uh, 300 uh, security specific checks outside of just vulnerability checks that we're doing. What are some of the other things that that have changed or that may have changed between what's now in production and sort of what's in your dev environment? And I think the net result here is a really focused punch list for that developer. You know, having them understand, hey, it's the highs and criticals that I want to focus on from a CVE perspective. And, you know, the tool has given me, um, you know, the version I've got in there, and now it's going to tell me where the fixed version is. So now I've got that for the highs and criticals. And, and as we start to get on the path of, um, you know, uh, adding another layer of prioritization on this stuff as we start looking at things like exploitability and future exploitability, uh, we'll be able to get even tighter on that. But again, allowing the developer to make some decisions here. And there may be things that fall into the high category or the critical category where that's how they've been uh, categorized by uh, the authority. However, you know, the way they're deploying it and the way it's being ultimately landing in production, there isn't, there's either compensated controls or there's risk mitigation already in place as part of the cloud security posture, they could apply for an exception or, or resolve that in another way, right? So, but again, I think isolating from a crush of data down to just a bit based on comparing what's in dev versus what's in production, I think is really one of those ways to make developers' lives easier as it relates to this. Um, prioritization. And again, you know, I think one of the things that we're, we're doing in our tool is we're allowing organizations and then ultimately setting global and then cascading that down to the application layer where, um, the application owners can also set their priorities, but we're allowing for each one of the rules or the, or, or of the, the checks that we're doing to be categorized by the organization based on its criticality. Right. And so even the things that are non CVE related, um, you know, the the developer can take a look and see what are what is the organization consider 
high or critical, right? And it could be something as simple as, you know, there's an, an issue with the Jenkins server, or there's an issue with, um, you know, the way I've configured the source code repository. So these are all things that we're going to bring to the developer's attention and allow them to, again, go through either a remediation process or an exception process. Um, you know, and then again, you know, as part of the application team, you know, if there's already compensating controls for some of the things that we're measuring for, we allow that team, if you have the right RBAC permissions, to go through and ultimately sort of uh, pre-mitigate some of the things that we're going to report, but you already know that you don't need to worry about, right? And then I think the other piece of this is, you know, around making sure that you have an escape hatch there, right? So whenever someone's under a deadline and there's pressure, uh, being able for them to relieve some of that pressure by saying, hey, I've got a good case to apply for a 30-day exception here. Let me go ahead and actually open a JIRA ticket, apply for the exception. And we'll see this during the demo where uh, as a developer, I can take this off my plate if I need to uh, in the short term. Now, I think the other piece of this is is around visibility, right? I think one of the, the biggest things that I found in my career when you start to introduce these types of standards is there isn't enough developer visibility into sort of what those are, right? So for us, um, you know, we like to put this right out there in the open so that everybody sort of understands it. And in most cases, what our customers are doing is they're saying, geez, how do I translate my SDLC, which all of my developers understand and know into, you know, sort of that custom set of rules, but it's incredibly important. Uh, and, and it's it, especially when it comes to things like, you know, overall frustration, you know, when a developer, you know, is, is looking at a system like this and says, Oh, here's a problem. Well, man, why didn't I know about this up front? I would have done something differently. Right. So again, making sure that that's, that's transparent, uh, making sure that there's, you know, different stages or different types of ways that we can report problems, right? We don't, you know, I think a lot of our customers, uh, some have chosen to block deployments based on certain, you know, sort of egregious things that they just don't want to ever see in production. And most of the cases where they've got a block deployment, it's usually through human error, right? Uh, there's been some issue, um, you know, and, and somebody didn't realize that something wasn't supposed to happen. Um, but again, I think for us, having that block versus simply alert, uh, especially in the lower environments, you know, you don't want to block a deployment to a development environment. That's very, very counterproductive, right? But, you know, you also want to make sure that there are certain things that cannot happen in production and you want to be prepared for those. But again, I think the level playing field here is helping everybody understand the targets, right? Having everyone understand the policies and the lines that they need to be coloring within. And if you do that, you get less frustration. So we'll talk a little bit about during the demo of sort of how we go about making those things very, very transparent. And then I think the other piece of this that we're really starting to get into is to provide actionable guidance, right? So for me, um, you know, when we do things like produce results from say a static code analysis scan. Um, I want to make sure that, you know, we pass through the exact bit, right? Or when we say, Hey, here's an issue. Uh, if it's a vulnerability, you know, Oh, this is the fixed version, right? So, you know, you, you need to now start to go through and say, how does this uh, deploying this fixed version help uh, impact my dependencies and what do I need to do in order to go ahead and adjust those? But I think, you know, from a remediation perspective, looking at things like, geez, you know, you guys are saying my Git repository is not configured correctly, or, you know, there was, um, a, there, there's a, a, you know, a, an insecure plugin that's being used in the Jenkins server where, you know, I might just, you know, be able to go ahead and open a Jira ticket and assign it to my DevOps guy. Uh, again, I think, you know, making this as friendly as possible to the developer. So they, one, don't have to go jumping from tool to tool to tool. They've got one single source of truth. They can come, they can see what the situation is. And then, again, get a recommendation, right? They may already have something in mind, but they can get a recommendation. We can provide a recommendation. And then they can ultimately go down the path of doing things like 
creating a, a Jira ticket from this, right? So it's like, hey, I'm going to go ahead and actually um, create the Jira ticket, and then I'm going to apply for an exception. And assuming that exception is approved, that and that problem is now off my plate for at least the next 30 days or 60 days um, because, you know, a security person is taking a look at it. So these types of scenarios, they need to be, in order for them to work for the developer, there has to be value without additional overhead. And I think that's one of the things that we're really focused on here. Um, the other piece of this, you heard me talk a lot about exceptions, right? And so as we were doing market research on our product, and as we were talking to, you know, a lot of our larger customers, you know, one of the things they were telling us was, well, look, we've got to have a way to, you know, manage or allow for exceptions. Like I, you know, I know if I'm a roll forward shop and I find a critical vulnerability and, and mainly this applies a lot, by the way, to uh, the more dynamic elements of the deployment process and the application security, right? So, you know, I need to be able to make sure that, you know, if there's a, um, a vulnerability that surfaces at the last minute, I can have a security analyst look at it, determine that, you know, this is not going to be exploitable based on how we're deploying it. Let me take that exception, document that exception, because again, um, you're going to need to explain this to an auditor at some point in theory, uh, and then ultimately time box that exception, right? And so I want to make sure that I have visibility as a developer into all of my expiring exceptions, right? So as I start to sit down and start to look at constructing the next version of the code for the microservice I'm responsible for, let me take a look at these exceptions that are expiring and make sure that I am either prepared to apply for an extension or I want to go ahead and make sure that these are at the top of my list in terms of things that I want to look at fixing. So again, extremely important. Uh, I think the tie back to JIRA here is also important to say, okay, here are all my exceptions. Here are all the JIRA tickets I created to go fix those. You know, again, how do I want to prioritize doing this? You know, obviously, if I've got something that's expiring in five days, I want to make sure that I take care of it. Um, and so, again, I think this is another way to go about improving the life of the developer who's living in this world of dealing with security. And uh, this is, you know, sort of some of the thoughtfulness that we've put into into that.